Hello everyone, I am here with 2020 U.S. Senate candidate Kimberly Graham, who is taking on Joni Ernst in the state of Iowa in a very flippable state. She can actually win this. She's been endorsed by Brand New Congress, and she's here to talk about her campaign. Kimberly, thank you so much for coming on the program. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's really exciting to have another Senate candidate on. I believe you are the second Senate candidate that I've brought on the show. The first one was Paula Jean Swearingen, and you are Senate candidate number two. So many fantastic brand new Congress members that I've talked to. Um, and you're running such a dynamic campaign, and I want to get to a quote from you because I think it's so fantastic. So everyone knows Joni Ernst for her infamous Make em Squeal commercial back in 2014. Um, or was it, uh, I'm not sure, I think it was 2014. But this is a yes. quote from you. So Joni Ernst campaigned on a promise to make em squeal in Washington, D.C. and get rid of corruption, but the only people squealing are Iowans harmed by her votes. Explain that to us, because I think it's such a fantastic tweet that, tweet that really encapsulates what's wrong with Joni Ernst. Right. So, you know, her whole uh, campaign really started to get traction with that infamous, famous, um, make, we're going to make them squeal in Washington, <laughs> right? So, um, which, which kind of ties in, so ties into um, something important about this race, which is, which is, ironically or, or interestingly tied to why I think we can win. I think Joni Ernst got elected in large part, not so much because people were interested in voting for a Republican, but because Iowans were interested in getting corruption out of Washington. And I think that they believed her. Yeah. <laughs> they, they believed her even, you know, that, hey, I think that's, we're a firmly purple state, right? We got about half Republicans or a third Republicans, a third Democrats and a third independents in, in Iowa. And I, I, what I've seen is Iowans will give somebody a chance that they trust, that, you know, they believe, um, and that will stand up for them. And that is how Joni Ertz portrayed herself, you know, and when that make them squeal commercial hit, I, of course, I mean, it's, of course, it's so catchy. It, it gained a lot of traction. And simply that slogan, honestly, was a huge part of when her campaign really started gaining traction. And what I mean by the only people um, squealing are Iowans harmed by her votes is, uh, you know, she's voted, I think, seven times now to repeal the Affordable Care Act, which, which, which if she wanted to repeal it and give universal single payer health care, I'd be I'd be saying, great, <laughs> repeal it all you want, right? If we have something better in store. But she's voted to repeal the ACA with absolutely no viable plan in place to, you know, protect pre existing conditions to keep kids on their parents insurance till they're 20, you know, 26 years old, and, and a few of the other things that that were great, and that are great about the Affordable Care Act that we did, were able to achieve with that. Um, you know, she she voted, she's voted to confirm everyone from Betsy DeVos to the head of the EPA to uh, Supreme Court Justice Kavanaugh to hundreds, I believe now over 100 federal district court judges that will be there until they pass away <laughs> because those are lifetime appointments you know and um, as an attorney like I am uh, uh, you know I really understand and, and maybe a lot of other people do but as an attorney knowing how important court decisions are to to what then happens with various areas of the law the fact that we now have well over a hundred federal district court judges confirmed, many of whom are entirely unqualified, regardless of their political, um, you know, political side, right, um, if you will, they're just unqualified. And the fact that they're sitting there now is going to be damaging to Iowans and to all Americans for years and years and years to come. I think recently there was something like a 36 or 38 year old um, person confirmed to the federal bench who had never set foot in a courtroom. Never. But because they were recommended by the Federalist Society, uh, they, they got through. And with a Republican-dominated Senate, they got through. And they, they simply, regardless of political ideology, they simply were unqualified, as have been cabinet you know, appointments, Betsy DeVos, and on and on and on. 
Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, one thing that I think you speak to is there is really, I think, a popularity and kind of this populist appeal to this idea of draining the swamp or making them squeal. But you're actually offering people a real anti-corruption message. First of all, you are not taking corporate PAC money. You are uncorrupted. This is a people-powered movement. And you actually would make them squeal, for lack of a better word, because <laughs> you have an anti-corruption platform. Like, you want to publicly finance elections and get money out of politics. So for people in Iowa who are actually looking for someone who will root out corruption, talk about your plan for campaign finance reform. Right. So, yeah, that, that's absolutely true. And I think what's important for people to understand, and, and I'm, I'm speaking now to people who may be um, considering supporting or who are supporting the DSCC-backed candidate in Iowa. And here's what I want those people to know. So her name's Teresa Greenfield. She's a very nice person. You know, we speak at a lot of the same events. So are all of the other people running for this seat. I mean, and I'm not saying that just to give lip service. Oh, they're nice people. They really are nice people. And I like them. And I think they have good intentions. But Teresa Greenfield so far has taken, I think it's approaching $40,000. It's it, the, the Washington Free Beacon, I know, but they did do their research. The Washington Free Beacon did an article on July 23rd about uh, Teresa Greenfield's uh, money that she's taken from lobbyists for corporations. So all of us in this race are saying, I'm not taking corporate PAC money, and that's great. But a lot of centrist Democrats, establishment Democrats are saying that. I'm not taking corporate PAC money. And people that don't know that there's also massive amounts of corporate lobbyist money don't know that their candidate is taking corporate lobbyist money. And in my opinion, that is just sort of a technicality, an end run, right? An end run around, I'm not taking corporate PAC money. So Teresa Greenfield has taken, I believe it's approaching $40,000, but anyone can look that up on Open Secrets, on the FEC reports. She's taken money from lobbyists for pharmaceutical industry, from healthcare industry lobbyists and big tobacco lobbyists, to name a few. And if we are saying that lobbyists and corporate PAC money and corporations are the problem, that they have been overrepresented and influencing our government, and that's why the most of us are not being represented, then I don't think that it's right that we are taking corporate lobbyist money. So this, this is not like these are all individuals. I want to make that clear. Like one, this one person in particular that um, that we researched and looked up is a partner in a lobbying firm, and you know you have to give your your occupation right when you give a, a donation like that. Um, and so we looked up the name of the lobbying firm, and it's a lobbying firm for tobacco, pharmaceuticals, and the healthcare industry. So you have to do a little research to find this stuff out. It's not that difficult though, and I just think you know. There's, there's a saying in the Bible, I'm going to paraphrase it. You can't serve two masters. Yeah. <laughs> and that's just a kind of a life saying, I think, right? You can't, you can't sort of be beholden to some people and, and then, you know, uh, say you're not beholden to this. It just doesn't work that way. So I think when you start out and if, if, if somebody gets elected who's already taken thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars from representatives of particular industries, I would find it really difficult to believe that the people from those industries are not going to expect you to be doing something for them once you are elected. And I only want to do things for, for lack of a better shorthand, for the people. I want to do the things that are going to help most of regular working people that are going to help children, that are going to help elders, that are going to help people living with disabilities, that are going to help regular lower and middle income working people in this country. Those are the people, when I say the people, that's that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about everybody except those top 10% of wealth and income earners and corporations, because they're gonna be just fine, I promise. No matter whether their taxes go way up, they're gonna be absolutely okay. I was talking to a Des Moines businessman a few months ago, a very wealthy businessman who donates a lot of money to Democrats, and he uh, said, tell me a little bit about your, you know, your, your, your philosophy, your platform, your campaign. And I was talking to him and I got to the part where, where I was going to say, 
And I think we should appropriately tax the very wealthy because, frankly, they're going to be fine, even if they're taxed way more than they are now. And we need to have that money to invest in the rest of everybody else. And for a split second before I said that, I thought, this is a really wealthy person. Maybe I shouldn't say that to him. <laughs> but I did it anyway. Like I said, for a split second, and then I thought, oh, that's ridiculous. You believe what you believe. Say what you say. You know, it is what it is. And I said that. And when I was done talking, he said, I really like one thing you said. And I'm thinking, hmm, what? I said, what? He said, you're right. I'm going to be just fine, even if my taxes go up a lot more than they are now. And he said, enlightened business people should know that when their workers are happier and doing better and are financially stable, their businesses will do better. Yeah, yeah. And that's <laughs> actually someone who understands, you know, the contradiction of capitalism, so to speak, because, you know, you want to increase profits. So what do you do? You cut, you know, um, the pay of your workers, you reduce benefits. But at the same time, if everyone does that, well, collectively, people are going to not have as much pur purchasing power and we can't buy the things that capitalists want us to buy. So people have to acknowledge that if you truly believe in capitalism like these business people do, then working people have to have money to purchase the goods and services that are produced. You know, so it's nice to see some of them at least acknowledge that. Um, and, and one thing, that, you know, I get a sense from you that you're so much different because it's really, really popular to talk the talk right now and talk about how we want to drain the swamp. And Republicans and Democrats say this because this really is a nonpartisan issue. We know that money is a corrosive influence in American politics. That's that's obvious to any political observer. But everyone wants to talk about, you know, how they're going to get, you know, corruption out. But they don't actually walk the walk. And as you said, you really have to look at the fine print, right? And these are all publicly available, you know, um, statistics. You can look at the FAC reports. If you look at Kimberly and compare, you know, you to anyone else who's running for the <laughs> Senate, it's going to be wildly different. So if you truly care about corruption, then you have to really do your research and look at who whose money you're taking because that's what people don't get like it's really easy and i get it because you know we have information shortages in this country we don't have the mainstream media covering these senate races so if somebody says i'm going to drain the swamp or make them squeal we just kind of take them at their word because it sounds nice but when they get in office change doesn't happen and we still are left feeling dissatisfied still wondering why change isn't happening and it's because we are electing people who aren't living up to that promise you actually are because you're you're walking the walk right now like you're not taking corporate back money which is so important right. so talk about your platform yeah. as well because you have a really robust platform and you really are someone who is you know uh, going to facilitate change because your platform is incredibly robust and progressive yeah well um yeah i think that that i think it's important too that we look at how somebody okay what somebody's done with their life up until the time they did they they ran for senate right what have they what's the demonstrated history what have they been doing and, you know, have they have they been in some kind of public service? I, you know, I think it's really interesting that Senator Tom Harkin, who, if you just say that word in the state of Iowa, everybody smiles because he was he was progressive and he was he was a champion for children's rights. He was a champion for protecting elderly, you know, our elders. He um, was a labor champion. He was the primary architect of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And you know, he was elected for 30 years here in the state of Iowa. He retired in 2014, and that's the seat that Senator Ernst ended up, you know, winning. Um, and what I've done for the past 20 years is primarily represented abused or neglected kids and parents in the juvenile court system here in Iowa. So I have... For the most part, I, and I've been a mediator and I've done some collaborative work, but that's been the majority of my career. In the last two years, I've been the attorney and guardian ad litem for all of the kids of participants in a drug court program. So these are people who, you know, most of them are in poverty. Most of them don't have sufficient education. Um, most of them don't have sufficient health care, especially mental health, mental health help and addiction treatment available to them. They don't have sufficient affordable housing. They don't have sufficient um, pay when they do go to work. You know, they want to work. They don't have sufficient child care. They want to work. But if they work, since they don't make a high salary, 
all of their money basically is going to childcare if they make over about thirty thousand dollars a year, which for you know for a mom with two kids or something is is very little money anyway. I mean, and so there's I I've seen with my own you know eyes for the last twenty years what we need to do to lift people up in this country because I see what they don't. I could say I've I've watched for 20 years how the lack of investment in people harms them and harms all of us, and we've invested really hard in the top 10 percent or so of people in this country for the last 40 years, and it's paid off great. Yeah, they are doing better. We've invested in them. By invested, I mean we've given them tax break after tax break after tax break after subsidy after subsidy after subsidy. We've put our money into helping the already wealthy. And it's 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 gone great for them. They're wealthier than ever before. You know, 30, 40 years ago, the top 10 percent controlled about a third of the wealth in this country. Today, they control about 75 percent of the wealth in this country. And there's that's not going to slow down until we get kind of regular working people, <laughs> you know, into Congress so that there's a critical mass of people there when this stuff's trying to be backroom dealed and wink, wink, nudge, nudge to stand up and say, no, I'm not going to vote for that because that's not going to help the people, right? So our platform kind of has all those things I just talked about. When I'm talking about the people I represent, you know, in court, um, it will help not only them, but all of us, you know, a universal single payer healthcare program, you know, similar to Canada's where the doctors and hospitals are still private, but you have one insurance, you know, you go to the doctor, you go to your hospital, whatever one you want to go to and gets billed to that one entity done. There's none of this appeal, denial back and forth. We're not going to pay for that medication, blah, blah, blah. You know, that that's, that's kind of the, the system. And that's, um, I think that's close to like the Sanders uh, Medicare for all bill. Um, I, would really want to make sure the reimbursement rates though are high enough. And I, I've looked through that bill and I don't specifically see something about reimbursement rates. It may be there and I've missed it, but that's my, sometimes, you know, <laughs> being a progressive, you get attacked by the center, but you also get attacked by other progressives. Ha, huh, it's so fun. So, <laughs> so when people say, are you for Medicare for all? Well, yes. And I want to make sure those reimbursement rates are high enough because if we're not reimbursing healthcare providers high enough, and I assume that that bill would do that. I mean, Senator Sanders is not a dummy. I assume that that bill does that. I just haven't seen the fine print. And as a lawyer, it's like, I want to see the fine print. Is this really going to be what I believe and hope it is? If it is, perfect. Um, so there's that. There's education. You know, we fund our schools on property taxes, which means the schools in the wealthy areas, there's a lot more property taxes. So there's a lot more money going to those schools. So our public schools have sadly, in spite of the best efforts of our teachers, our awesome public school teachers, of which I'm a product of public schools, and um, our staff in public schools, in spite of all their best efforts, the funding is so disparate you know, from a very, uh, a neighborhood with a lot of poverty and low property values to a neighborhood with a, a high property values, because that's where we fund our schools from. So we need to do whatever it takes to equally fund our schools. And in fact, I would argue we need to give those schools in the more impoverished areas with lower property values, even a little boost to help them because those families typically have experienced the trauma of poverty and multiple other traumas that tend to, to coexist with poverty. And so those schools especially need school nurses, school counselors, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, tutors, you know, extra help to bring those kids up. And, you know, <laughs> we just have to, got to stop funding our schools unequally because schools should be an equalizer. And they're not. Schools have become basically, um, you know, uh, 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 they do the opposite. They, yeah. they create a, an unequal opportunity because what school did you go to? What opportunities did you have? But I will say this, that this also circles back to income. 
the, the biggest um, indicator or, or um, indicator for academic success in children. So I, uh, sometimes when I'm giving a speech, I'll have people guess, like, what do you think is the biggest indicator of academic success in children? And people will guess all kinds of things. It's household income. Household income. So it's, it's not how educated were the parents. It's not your neighborhood per se. It's not, it's household income. And so to that end, you know, we need bare minimum $15 an hour minimum wage federally here in the state of Iowa. The minimum wage is $7 and 25 cents per hour. I know some states have increased it and some municipalities have increased it, but here it's still 725. Uh, we actually have some cities here in Iowa, uh, Iowa City in particular, who raised it and the Republican governor said, no, you can't do that. <laughs> Made them reverse it. And then they went around and voluntarily got a lot of businesses to sign on to do it on a voluntary basis. But basically, our Republic or Republican leadership in this state um, would, wouldn't allow the city of Iowa City to do that. But we need at least a $15 minimum wage with index for inflation, you know, so it continues to rise. Um, you know, health care uh, that includes mental health and addiction treatment. So here in the state of Iowa, we had Medicaid which um, then got privatized by our Republican governor. And it would take three hours to talk about the mess that Medicaid is in Iowa right now. But the shorthand is people are being denied things, they, treatments they need, drugs they need, procedures they need. Um, and there's a lot of irregularities, let's say that, about what's going on with these private Medicaid providers. We have a great auditor here um, who got elected in 2018, Rob Sand. Uh, he's the only Democrat <laughs> in the in the you know in the hierarchy of, of our uh, you know upper leadership, you know governor's office, Secretary of State, all those positions. Rob is the only Democrat, and he's the auditor. And so he is taking a really hard look at the privatization of Medicaid here in Iowa and doing a good job at starting to figure out where all the, where all the money's going basically. <laughs> um, but I used to be able to get clients of mine, the parents um, into drug treatment for as long as it took for them to get well and get on their feet. There's a really great um, drug treatment place here in Iowa called Clearview Recovery that I've had many clients go to and leave successfully and go on to be successful with getting their kids back in their care. And I see them years later and they're still doing well. It's a really great inpatient uh, drug treatment program that's more like a home environment. It's wonderful. Well, starting I think about a year ago, uh, the private Medicaid providers said, we're only gonna pay for 30 days of treatment at Clearview. 30 days to kick a methamphetamine addiction? Addiction is nothing. Nothing. They might as well have said, we're just not going to pay for drug treatment anymore <laughs> because 30 days is so woefully insufficient. And I see that. I'm, I've seen personally the results of only being able to get my client 30 days worth of treatment versus four months, five months, six months, you know, whatever it, it used to take for them to stabilize and, and be on a really good, secure, stable path to leave their in, in, inpatient treatment facility. So it you know it just goes it just goes on and on and on. Yeah, your your platform is huge, and we'll have you know a link to your website on the screen so people can check it out. But what really makes you different from other candidates is you're so focused on like the policy details and policy outcomes. So I love the way you talk about healthcare, and you you really describe single payer because now there's so many people who are Democrats who say, well, you know, I support Medicare for all or the spirit of Medicare for all or something along those lines when they don't actually mean single payer, which is frustrating. So I like that you're like glued to the details of it. <laughs> and and to your point about the reimbursement rate, I, I read something not too long ago. I don't know if it was in regards to the uh, 2019 iteration of Medicare for all or Bernie Sanders 2017 version. But I believe that once you take into account the administrative costs reduction, then it would be about the same, although I'm not sure. But I'm glad that there are people like you who would push Bernie on this, because what we want is a robust healthcare system that is great, that is not going to have any issues like we want it to function and be stable because 
the point is not just to pass Medicare for all and check it off of our list. We want it to be, you know, able to stand the test of time. And what I like is that people like you will be in the Senate and push Bernie further because I actually I've criticized Bernie Sanders version of the bill because it actually has a four year roll as, as opposed to a two year rollout, which I don't like. Um, so we need people who are willing to push the envelope. And there's really even though like we have some people who I think would vote for Medicare for all in the Senate, like Elizabeth Warren and Jeff Merkley, I don't think that they would push the envelope further, like push that bill further to the left. So I kind of wanted you to actually talk about that dynamic because we have an increasing block of progressive Democrats within the House of Representatives, but there's basically a small handful in the Senate and that's being really charitable. Like you can count all the progressives on one hand and I use the word progressive loosely, right? So how do you think you would be able to influence your colleagues because you don't have that much backup unless you and Paula Jean get elected together in the Senate. And Betsy Sweet. And Betsy Sweet. You guys, like, <laughs> if if we don't get all three of you, you, you're either going to be, like, standing alone trying to influence Elizabeth Warren and Jeff Merkley to kind of push further. Um, so, I mean, like, how do you affect change when your block is super small in the Senate? Because the dynamic there is super different. Like, in the House, we have a, a growing vocal block, as I alluded to. But in the Senate, like, I don't know how to do that strategically. So... What do you think would be the best way to really push the narrative, you know, just in general on the Overton window rather to the left in the Senate? Right, right. So, uh, you know, to state the like the obvious, like, you know, we have to get some of us in there. Right. First. Right. Okay, like more than just Sanders and Warren and maybe Mark Lee, you know, um, I think once you start to get a critical mass of, you know, what's a critical mass? I don't know. But, you know, more than a couple, yeah. um, then you'll start to see that. And I and, and here's the other thing. So. I've done a lot of mediation as well. I do. I mediate people's divorces, and and yes, that's not easy. <laughs> and um and um I'm told anyway. People have told me over the years I'm I'm pretty good at it. And I I I rarely have people walk out of my mediation and not have settled their their case. And it might take hours and hours and hours, but we almost always get there. And. I think there's a couple of things to that 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 are applicable to to influencing others in the United States Senate. So the first is you have to establish some kind of relationship and connection to people, even to people that maybe you normally wouldn't. You know, I've mediated cases for probably hundreds of people that I would never like choose to be friends with, right? Like I wouldn't pick them out of a lineup and say, oh, I have so much in common with you. I want to be your friend, right? No. But I'm there to get something done and I genuinely want to help um, them move their family forward. And so you have to create some kind of relationship, number one. And I am, I think, pretty good at creating relationships with people, even if we have a lot of disagreements. And I think that's really important as a U.S. Senator. And, and, <laughs> and that's another one of those things that sometimes draws fire from the very progressive left is, you know, how would you even, how would you even speak to them? Blah! You know, well, <laughs> you know what? Do you want to get something done or don't you? Well, to be fair, I will say in their defense, <laughs> like usually when we hear like bipartisanship or like reaching across the aisle, it usually means to screw us. So I get the cynicism, oh, yeah, but for, no, yeah, for no. someone <laughs> like you, you're not going to compromise. So when you say it, those negative connotations aren't actually attached to it. Because when, when you right. say that, like the way that I hear it is, okay, you're going to bring them to your side and not go to their side, which is the key difference. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So that's exactly right. So you have to develop some kind of relationship with them, however you do that, you know, whatever you find in common, it could be they have a 20 year old son, I have a 20 year old son, right. you know, wh whatever, it could be any, they have a dog, I have a dog, whatever. You have to find those hu really human connections with people. You know, um, I think I don't know if the chicken or egg happened first, I don't know. But I know there used to be like, lunches of senators, not just Democrat lunch, not just Republican lunch, but there used to be like lunches with senators. It didn't matter. You know what I mean? People would sit down and, you know, break bread together, right? We hear about the importance of breaking bread. I don't think that happens anymore. The last I heard there were literally like the GOP lunch every week and the Dem lunch every week. Well, okay, I get that. I, I get the reason for wanting to be around just your people. That's a human thing. And like I said, if we can't find, create any relationships, how are we progressives ever going to bring anyone, you know, even start to bring anyone over to our side? 
how? I don't think I don't think that's a non-starter. So you start to create relationships and you listen. Again, it doesn't mean that you're going to do what they what they think that, you know, that they want to do. But when you listen to people, something very interesting happens. They start becoming interested in listening to you. <laughs> but you have to first listen to them. So so there's that. And then there's just being very persistent and, and giving them real reasons. And, you know, is it going to happen in a day? No, a week? No, a month? No. But if you're persistent and you really are interested in creating change or getting people to see your, your side, you create relationships, you listen to them, you tell stories. Yeah. And, and, you, and you tell real stories. Like, you know, my friend um, Robin Stone, who was the Delaware here in Iowa, the D Delaware County Party Democratic Chair. Um, she was diagnosed about somewhere about six weeks ago, I think now, um, with thyroid cancer. And it's a very rare type of thyroid cancer. Not like the usual one, from what I understand, is reasonably easy to, to cure. They remove your thyroid. And, you know, probably most of the time, I think people have a very good um, prognosis with, with most thyroid cancers. This was a very rare, very aggressive, very deadly one. <clears throat> she wanted to go to Mayo Clinic, which is not very far from here. It's in southern uh, Minnesota. It was out of her network. They wanted $16,000 to even have her walk in the front door. Now, will we ever know if she would have survived it or had a longer quality, better quality of life for as long as she had lived? Had she gone to Mayo? We'll never know because she didn't go there. She went to a different hospital, which is a really good hospital here in Iowa, but they did not have those specific experts in that type of rare thyroid cancer that she really wanted to go see. And she passed away a couple of weeks ago, very quickly after her diagnosis. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. It, thank you. Um, it was a huge loss for, yeah. for everyone, for her family, of course, a horrible, tragic loss. And for all of us who knew her, she was amazing and quite a force for change and, uh, brilliant, and she <laughs> she had a tracheotomy the last several weeks of her life, which was just really horrible and hard to deal with. She had it replaced several times, and a couple, a week or week and a half, two weeks, somewhere in that window before she passed away, she was in the emergency room, and she messaged me on Facebook from the. She says, "I'm in the emergency room. I want you to have my endorsement. I want you to keep talking about me." And don't ever stop fighting for a universal single payer healthcare system. And so Robin, <laughs> I'm talking about you again. <laughs> um, and so I do. And those are the kinds of stories that you tell colleagues that maybe don't see it the way you see it right now. You know, you tell real stories about the young man in Dubuque who in 2018 lost his life from rationing insulin. And now his mother is going around talking about the the amorality of this in a wealthy nation. And it is amoral, yeah. you know, and and if it doesn't move those people, well, hopefully those kind of stories will move their voters. Exactly. And it's and not like end, you're... they'll end up gone from Ex the Senate. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And I think that building rapport is so important. Like you're not going to get them on your side for everything. But this strategy, I think if you're a senator, you really have no choice. And there has been a degree of success. Like my favorite example is Bernie Sanders. He got a Tea Party senator, Mike Lee, to get on board with his um, his plan to enact the War Powers Act to stop U.S. complicity to Saudi Arabia's genocide in Yemen. Now, it passed the House and the Senate. It was vetoed by Donald Trump. But, I mean, these are the things that you can do. And, when, when, like, when you hear the way that Republicans talk about Bernie Sanders, they think he's a communist. They think he's crazy. But they still say, well, you know, at least Bernie Sanders is honest. You know, they'll, they'll say something like that. So they kind of understand him, at least from a human level. And I think that when you have 99 other colleagues and that's it, you don't really have much of a choice but to kind of try to humanize each other and try to get them to your side, not, you know, to capitulate, but get them to your side. Now, 
when it comes to someone else, like let's say there's another senator like Ron Wyden, if he wants to work with a Republican, my senator, um, I cringe because I wonder how much is he selling me out. Um, but when it's someone like you or Bernie Sanders, then I think, okay, they're trying to bring people to our side and not the other way around. So that's such a key difference and it's so important. And I'm glad that you kind of thought this through because like, I genuinely don't know what I would do if I were a senator and I never want to be in that position. But if I were, <laughs> like, I don't know what to do, especially with the block being so small. But I mean, the point that you made was we have to elect more progressives in the Senate. So with that being said, I'm sure that everyone is enthusiastic about your campaign. And at this point, we're just preaching to the choir. So if we want to help elect you, what can we do so you can go to kimberlyforiowa.com that's our website and there's donate and volunteer buttons there we by the way if you think well i don't live in iowa i can't volunteer oh no no so this is for those of you who followed or knew about better o'rourke's campaign no we're not follow, we're not you know we're not on better o'rourke's platform <laughs> but but his campaign though for u.s senate was amazing okay he got he had supporters and volunteers all over the country and that's what it was going to take to get rid of ted cruz and darn it if he didn't come close um that's kind of that that model of having volunteers all over the nation is what we are building out right now so if you want to let's and especially if you live in like a solid blue state right if your senators are already democrats that you're okay with um or or there's no progressive challenger and you want to find a flippable U.S. Senate seat and help that person in the primary, help a real progressive, we would love to have your help. You can, you know, volunteer to do text banking, volunteer to do lots of different things remotely. So you don't have to physically be here in the state of Iowa physically knocking on doors to help. So there's a volunteer button on the Kimberly for Iowa website that you can go to and sign up to volunteer. And there's a field for your state so we know, you know, physically where you are. Um, donating, of course. And I would say this, too. I totally get that impulse to say, at least for a lot of people, maybe not for really true progressives, but for a lot of people to kind of hang back and say, I'm going to wait until the after the primary, and then I'll give some money to whoever our Democratic nominee is, right? I get that impulse because I used, I used to be that person, okay? I used to be that person where I would just like, eh, you know, I'm a, I'm a single mom. I don't make a ton of money as an attorney for kids. I have massive student loan debt myself. I still do. I'm not going to donate until, you know, after the primary. Well, if we all do that, <laughs> we're going to keep getting the Congress we have now, with a few exceptions of, of progressives that are in there, meaning we're only going to get people who are either already wealthy or very connected to wealth into positions of power at the federal, you know, representative level. So if you're okay with keeping the Congress we have, by all means, don't donate to any campaigns until after your primaries. <laughs> but if you want to get progressives into office, progressives like AOC and Ilhan Omar and Presley and, you know, all, we know them all, then please, please, please donate now because Sometimes, you know, I didn't used to understand either. Why do you need so much money to run for office? Just run. Okay, my campaign manager, my events coordinator and fundraising coordinator, my digital outreach person, because I can't be on Twitter and Facebook all day, but I need somebody to be so that we can amplify the message of the campaign across the state and across the nation. A finance director, gas to drive all over a really, really big state. I was huge. <laughs> You know, and on and on. Yard signs, campaign materials, um, uh, tables. Like if we go to certain events, they charge us a couple hundred dollars to like have to be there, like to be there and to connect with a few hundred voters. So, I mean, the bare bones of this campaign, at, as of as we sit here today, is in excess of ten thousand dollars, and the vast majority of that per month, ten thousand dollars per month to keep my campaign going. And that's mostly staff salaries. And by the way, I don't get a dime. I'm a volunteer here. <laughs> but of course, my campaign manager and events coordinator, all those people get salaries as they should, right? And I want to pay them a decent salary. Um, I'm paying them market rates for those jobs. I'm not, you know, overpaying them, but they deserve those salaries and they, they should be paying them. But just so people know, that's where all this money goes to is mostly salaries, people to 
do all of this organizing. We, we need to hire a, a field organizer ASAP. We're looking for one now. That's going to be another several thousand dollars per month. Um, somebody to organize the volunteers, to organize the boots on the ground, the door knockers, the canvassers, you know, the, the text bankers, all of those people. That all takes people and people should be paid, right? You know, there's volunteers, but you also have to have a certain core staff that has to be paid. Um, so donate, 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 donate. <laughs> and also we have a new tool that we think is the first time that anyone running for office uh, has ever used it, which is peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. So if you go to our website, hopefully there's more information on it there. I, I haven't looked at the website in a little while since we got it up and running. But what that means is, you know how like you'll see people post a fundraiser on their Facebook page, like I'm raising money today for, you know, um, puppy protection or whatever, you know, <laughs> like like save the puppies or whatever. Um, well, we have that same thing now where people can sign up and like put a, do a fundraiser. Maybe they can't give a lot of money, but maybe they can get their friends to each pitch in five bucks, and then together you can send our campaign a couple hundred bucks, right, or 500 bucks or whatever from your friends and your contacts that you know. And so a lot of nonprofits use that. Um, we actually reached out and had the, the platform that does this modify their platform a little bit so that we could collect the information that we need to comply with FEC regulations. So we think we're the first campaign to ever do this kind of fundraising, but you got to get creative <laughs> when you don't have those corporations to go to. <laughs> so, um, so we have that too. So we just say donate, volunteer, spread the word, retweet, share on Facebook, um, because all of that helps just to get the word out because the, the, the biggest uphill battle here is going to be funding. Um, we've been to 49 of our 99 counties so far and we're keeping on going. We actually got a great deal on a supporter renting us a, an RV that we're getting probably next week. So we're going to have that wrapped and we're going to be driving all over Iowa, like all over Iowa to talk to people and listen with people. Um, so that'll be really helpful because you can't miss it when it rolls into a town of 500 people. Everybody will be talking about it. Yeah. <laughs> That's so, exciting. Yeah. Those and are, those and on your website, beautiful. too, I will say, I'll give you credit, because when you go to that website on your front page, you have like four steps for things that you can do to help out the campaign. And I love that you did the peer to peer fundraising thing, because I'll tell you, someone who like, I don't ever really go on Facebook that often. But when I see the, the pictures of sad puppies, speaking of like puppy fundraisers, I feel compelled to donate, right? It's it's so simple, it's easy. So that's a really, uh, I think, innovative way to uh, raise awareness about your campaign and raise money, so kudos to you. So look, let me just say this. Um, let me make my pitch for Kimberly. We need a Senate that is more progressive. We're making some progress in the House of Representatives, but we have not made that much progress in the Senate. So this is a down payment for actual structural change if you donate to um, Kimberly. And there's a lot of people who are great progressives running for the Senate. You brought up Beto, and that reminded me that I also had Sema Hernandez on the show running in Texas against John Cornyn, who's a phenomenal progressive. So we have her, we have Betsy Sweet, we have Paul Jean Swearingen, and Kimberly uh, Graham. Imagine if all four of you got elected, like the amount of change that that would make. And there could be other Senate candidates that I'm missing. And I apologize to those people if, I, uh, if I'm missing yeah. you. But like this really is a national movement. And we have to participate either by donating or putting in the time. If we can't, you know, uh, contribute monetarily, we can contribute our time. That's really important. Yeah. And judges and judges. The Senate confirms judges, y'all. So important. So Senate important. Senate confirms judges. So if you want different judges confirmed down the line, you got to get more progressives into the Senate. Yeah, yeah, this is crucial. So I think that 2020 is going to be the year when progressives actually start taking on the Senate because we, you know, we we got our foot in the door in the House. Now it's time we conquer the Senate. And Kimberly, thank you so much for. Uh, starting that movement uh, uh, or joining it with brand new Congress and whatnot. And thank you for coming on the show to talk about your uh, campaign. Thank you so much, Mike. I appreciate your time.